Shalom, and welcome to Christians with Torah, the Beit Tehillah Community Podcast. We believe the Torah is relevant for our lives today, God's teachings and instructions. You may very well be part of the first generation to be born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, and have the Torah, a Christian with Torah. Join us as we honor the living God through the study of His Word, topical conversations, and interviews with special guests. Please welcome our hosts, Pastor Nick Plummer and Ryan Cabrera. Shalom, everybody, and welcome to Christians with Torah, the Beit Tehillah Community Podcast. I'm your co-host, Ryan Cabrera, and I'm here in Studio B with Pastor Nick it Plummer. Studio B. Good to be here. It is. It is good to be here. Praise God. The month of Ab. Uh, that's right. That's right. So uh, welcome, everybody, to Christians with Torah, where we are Christians, and we believe the whole Bible, from Genesis to Maps, is relevant to believers today. And that means that we also include the Torah in that. Hence, Christians with Torah. Now, for the last four years, our episodes were on the tour portions, the weekly tour portions. And so if you have something you're looking for on a weekly tour portion, you can just go on our podcast, whether that's on Spotify, Apple, you know, music or podcast, um, SoundCloud, any of those places. You can search by the tour portion and you'll find four episodes for each one. And so you can hear over four years kind of what we were talking about when it came to the tour portions. This year, we've been doing the book of Matthew, and today we're doing uh, Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 through 21, uh, which will be very good. You guys want to stay for this, because this is some some crux of our faith. What's well, the 27? Type of stuff. That's what I meant, 27. But we're going to be reading. See, I always read this one instead of this one. I don't know why, why I do Matthew that. Matthew 17, verses 14 through 27. That's a nice little snippet, nice it is. little clip. So, because uh, we, we just got past the transfiguration, so now we're going to get down to business. Do you know what else we just got past? The ninth of off. Yes. So we are we are done with the three weeks of affliction, yeah. which as a reminder goes from Tammu seventeen, which commemorates the golden calf incident at Sinai, and ends in the ninth of Av, which is a historical day where lots of bad things have happened to Israel and the yeah. Jewish people, including the destruction of both temples. Inquisition. And now we are headed towards Elul one, right? So we're in this little like uh, little little uh, limbo period where everything's kind of kosher and, and calm, right? And then Elul 1 starts the season of Teshuvah. And so there'll yeah. be more to come on Teshuvah. We'll probably do a podcast on Teshuvah specifically coming up. Of course. Um, but Elul 1 begins August 27th in the evening. And so you want to be <clears throat> getting yourself ready to go. We here at Beit Tehillah as a congregation, and you guys are invited and welcome to join us. We do a Daniel fast, and we have resources that we can email to you or send to you. If you want those resources, shoot me an email at That's Ryan. True at twopraise.net. What an incredible season. Love to get that to you. So let's jump into Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 through 27. I yeah. think Pastor Nick's going to read. I'm going to read. 14 through 21. So the, the caption is, a boy possessed with a demon. Matthew 17, 14 through 21. Here we go. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire, and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove, hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Wow. Right after the transfiguration. Yep. Right? Absolutely. Well, and, you know, I would I would say that if I was one of the disciples, I'd be in a similar position, you know, with the brain. So um, verse 14 here, uh, 14 and 15, And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. I could imagine that feeling, right? For he is lunatic and sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. So he's worried about his son. Not only does his son uh, have this uh, epileptic fit, right, um, but he's 
he's worried because these things cause him to fall in dangerous places. Yeah, he's like no control over his body. Right. And so the man that came to Yeshua showed him respect by calling him Lord and bowing before him, right? Uh, that he would show, and asking that he would show mercy on his son, calling him Lord. He believed it, yeah. That's right. And so this word lunatic is the Greek word. Pastor Nick, do you want to pronounce this word for us? <laughs> yes. Seleniatsumi. Seleniatsumi, yeah. Seleniatsumi. Yeah, so we listen to the Blue Letter Bible guy, yeah. which he's got kind of a, a bit of a country accent, and he pronounces the Greek. And uh, there's certain words in Greek that, like, it's just hard to get the right emphasis on the right syllab- syllable, you know? The, we put the wrong emphasis what on does the it wrong mean? syllable. So Seleniatsumi, it means to be crazy. The sun could have been an epileptic. And there's some, I'm going to get into some stuff on uh, this same account in Mark. So lunatic is not in your right mind. Right. To some degree. Correct. Um, Don't have all your faculties. Correct. Correct. Uh, And so this word vexed also, because it says that he was lunatic, right? And sore vexed. Oh. And so this is a Greek word called, uh, that's pasco. Pasco. And it means to experience a sensation or impression, usually painful and to suffer. So clearly he's having these fits and he's suffering from the fits, right? This is causing a problem for him. Uh, it also seems that the boy who was lunatic would suffer uh, this epileptic fit and would have no control of his body. This would explain the harm that would come to him from being near a fire or a body of water. The demons always want to hurt us in any way that they can and even try to kill us. And we're talking about a youth. We are, yeah. A son, a youth. Right, and youth. the father is obviously you know, wanting to help his son get some relief, you know? And so he's heard about this, this man, Jesus, that heals the sick, right? And uh, he brings him to him, and what does Jesus do? Nothing yet, right? We haven't gotten there? No. So what happened to the man's son when he brought him to the disciples? They could not heal him. Yeah. So this is, this is kind of a, a point that uh, I've had recently that's 12 disciples. A lot of thought on. That's a group. Well, I, I mean, this, this, this frustration. Nobody this, stood out. I've had some personal experiences with laying hands and praying and people not being healed. And that is a frustrating situation because you're like, well, Lord, it's, what do you mean my faith? I mean, how, yeah. how much more faith do I have than what to more, lay hands more, on somebody and be obedient? But what more can we do but to do it? I, you did it. I a thousand percent agree. It's better than That's saying, That's why I'm well, looking I, at him like balls in your court. Yeah, it's your it's, name it's on the line. It's better than saying, well, you know, I should have prayed for them, but I didn't. Ah, interesting. I'm just saying, I'd rather put my faith <clears throat> out there. And I think there's two pieces to this puzzle, though, right? Because in this Matthew account, uh, we're, let's read the next two verses, and then I want you to unpack how Jesus is in the Matthew account is talking to the disciples, right? And it says here, in uh, verses 17 and 18. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. So in this case, he's talking to a whole generation of people. Are you you going to bring out Mark? I will. I will. We're going to get there. No, because I think that's a good point. It is. It is. I want to get... I want to get through this part in Matthew, and then we'll go back over to Mark and kind of uh, contrast it. And so the disciples had been given authority to heal, but they had not yet learned how to appropriate the power of God consistently. Do you ever feel that way? I feel like sometimes my my faith is on like a, a roller coaster a little bit. You know, like sometimes I'm ready to go, you know, storm the gates of hell with a squirt gun, and other times I'm like, yeah, let somebody else do it, you know? And that's probably not you know, maybe that's normal, but it's not like probably the best way to be. I also think that if you're going to storm the gates of hell with a squirt gun, make sure God told you to do it, right? Because I think that's part of this whole thing about faith is also hearing from God and doing his will, right? Um, The word perverse in this uh, wicked and perverse generation line is the Greek word diastrepho, and it means to distort, i.e. figuratively misinterpret or morally corrupt, um, to pervert or turn away. So this is to twist something, right? Pervert it, um, to distort what it is. And this is interesting because how many times do we read things and then the teachings that we've heard over the years, we come to realize we're a bit distorted from what it really means, especially if you read it in context. People um, take things to, to and really twist them, right? 
So then what did the disciples ask Yeshua when they took him apart or pulled him to the side, when they got to him privately? Why could not we cast him out? So they asked him, what, Lord, to kind of like the position that I've been in, right? I, I prayed, we laid hands, we did, you know, we did the thing, Lord, and, it, and he wasn't healed. This could be especially troublesome in a situation where you know, they had already been sent out before to go and heal, and so they had experienced praying and healing people and casting out demons. They've already experienced that power and authority. So then when they come to someone and they're not able to cast it out, they're troubled because they were, they've been given that power and, and now it's not working. And they're like, well, Lord, what's, what's going on here? It seems like a pretty heavy-duty devil. Well, I, okay, to cause but that. I'm just saying it's that. the power of a even more heavy duty God that, yeah. that's put inside of us. But, but the thing is, remember, there was 12 disciples. You think one out of the bunch would have something? I mean, you but, would think. But I guess they all had to learn something. So that was a lesson for all 12 to learn. Well, and this is you and can't then, just put Peter on the spot. Right. And this James is what I'm John. trying to figure out is is it's almost like when the disciples came to Jesus and said. You know, this man has been like this since birth, right? He's been afflicted right. since birth. You know, was it him or his parents that sinned? That's in Mark. It's in Matthew 2, right? Okay. Um, but he asks that, right? It was it him or his parents that sinned? And Jesus says, neither, but that the, the, uh, the power of God be made manifest, right? This is in a couple chapters back in Matthew. And that makes me think that there's other things at play right? And that God's not a genie, right? He's, a, he's the sovereign deity of the universe. And as much as we think Lord's, the Lord has given us power and authority, we have to, we're doing his bidding, right? So when we lay hands on somebody and pray, all we can do is then depend on God to do whatever he's going to do. We've been obedient to that end, right? Um, or at least so I thought until I was reading this, and then I got a little, you know, disenfranchised. I don't know. I go back and forth. I vacillate. So let's read uh, verses 20 and 21. It says here, And Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, and this is him talking with them privately, For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. How be it this kind go out, go with that, not, sorry, how be it this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. And I do want to mention that some manuscripts uh, in the Greek omit verse 21 altogether. Just The prayer and the fasting? Yes, the whole verse. Interesting. I thought it was We're, just the fasting part. That's in Mark, right? So gotcha. I'm going to jump over to Mark real quick, because this account is also found in Mark. And I find, um, I find it very interesting. Jesus heals a boy. Um, or a, a boy is healed is the, is the title here. And Jesus walks up on a group of, you know, people in a crowd that are surrounding the disciples because there's a bit of a, a scuffle. And he asks one of the scribes and says, what are you discussing? And then it says, uh, this is verse 16 of chapter 9. What is it now, Matthew Mark what? 9, I'm going to start at 16. And so when he asked the scribes, what are you discussing? And then one in the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And whenever he, and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. So this is obviously giving a little more detail about what happens to the boy, right? He also said, answered and said, this, and so this is what Jesus says. And this is Jesus. In this case, it appears, according to the text here, that Jesus is talking to the Father, okay? Which is different than way, the way I understood it in Matthew. It, it almost appeared as if in Matthew, Jesus is talking to the disciples. Right. But here's what he says. He answered him and said in verse 19, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him, and he saw him immediately. Th and he saw him. Immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, the father answered him and said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. You know, that's an interesting point because it's not in Matthew about since a child. 
I don't see it in It's not, and also the part about foaming at the mouth, gnashing his teeth, because you pull these context clues to say that he's an epileptic. That scripture interprets scripture. Right. Exactly. So then, um, all right, so now verse 23, because he says, uh, in 22, it says, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to the Father, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Mm. Mm -mm Mm-mm-mm. And 24, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. That's the the, father? That's the father. And that's what I think we should be crying out. That was good. It is, oh man. It was on the father. It was on the father. So when Jesus saw the people, when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly and came out of him and he became as one dead so that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Interesting. A little more detail in there. It is. And, and, Suddenly, there's and a lot And as action. you mentioned in Mark, that word fasting is in, not in some of the older manuscripts, just the prayer part. But, like, you take these two eyewitness accounts of this event that happened, and you, you mold them together, and you can see that Jesus could be talking to both the disciples and to the Father, right? That it's our unbelief, and that I struggle with because I'm like, Lord, like, <clears throat> how much more belief can I have? Like, I mean— we, there's a, a faith that we have that causes us to act. And I feel like what other faith is there than the one that causes us to act? We act by faith. We don't know how it's going to happen or even if this is what we're supposed to be doing. We do it by faith. We do it because the Word of God said so. So I'm going to act on this. And so I feel like that's like, where's the unbelief in that? You know, and maybe the Father hadn't prayed. Maybe he hadn't believed you know, maybe that was what the struggle well, was. Well, we should know if we don't have enough faith, though. Yeah. Like going into something, why are we actually going to pray for somebody? Yeah. What, what's the motives? What, what's it all about? And then as you're going forward in that motion, what's going on while you're praying? What are you thinking? What are you doing? And then what's the afterthought after you did it? Are you doubting yourself? Are you well, saying, and that's you know, what I prayed I, and that's what I mean. name? I just, I just believe. I feel confident enough that when I pray, I pray. Yeah. I don't have any doubts. I'm not uncertain. I don't speak anything that's of the contrary. So I leave it at that. Yeah. And then see what God does. Well, and that's just it. The wait and see game, I think, is where people struggle. Because I feel like we have this inclination to think that I prayed, now God's has to act. And I don't know that that's the case. I don't know how it works, right? I mean, that's, I think, I've seen it happen both ways. Where, like, I've seen the miraculous happen before my eyes. I've seen the miraculous happen from that as if planting a seed and watching the miracle grow into something. And then I've seen it to where you're like left, well, Lord, was the answer no, you know? Right. And, and I, that doesn't sit well with me because I feel like, you know, we've been given that power and authority and we're, we're working towards appropriating it by faith. So then, you know, so it's, it's, it's a hodgepodge of God's sovereign, right? And that's the thing. We're, you know, it's the will of God that we're dealing with. And we want to be in his will. And he says that when we pray his will, he obviously wor- works on our behalf. Well, if people are going to come for prayer, we should have enough faith to pray for them. Yeah. You know, that's all I can say, you know. Matt, right on the spot, like, oh, I'll pray for you right yeah. now. Don't wait. Yeah, I agree with that you too. Know, I catch myself all the time, like, mm-hmm. someone would mm-hmm. say something, I said, can I pray for you right now? Yeah. Boom, put my hand on their foot or their... More and more, I'm in the same boat because... I just feel it. Because here's the thing. Tomorrow is not promised. Right. I've been having this with worship too. Because like, you know, sometimes you, we could be lackadaisical. Oh, somebody's singing a song, you yeah. know, let me just sit, you know, or whatever. And more and more, I'm like, what if no. this is my last chance? I know. I'm like, no, I'm going to worship. That's what I'm saying. What if this I, is I it? Agree. What if this is all I get? And I agree. And cherishing that moment. And I'm right to, in front of the screen. To praise God. And the worship team's right here. And I'm right there. Yeah. And I just, I go, I just focus... Yeah. People are dancing around me. I just focus on the words and like I like when I'm singing, I'm like, yes, like in the back of my head. Yeah. Yes, he's mighty. Yes, he's this. Yes, he's that. Because that confirms. Because if you're singing along, you're paying attention. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and, and I just feel like we should be expressing 
our faith to God. You know, like I, I know that like sometimes it's like, oh, I don't want to raise my hands or whatever, worried about the people around us. And it's like, no, 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 no. Like all of that has to be just cast aside because the Lord is worthy of our praise. And it's like, right. who am I to not give him that praise? You meditate on that. And it, oh, exactly. So, all right, let's keep rolling here. I got some bullet points. Um, the word unbelief is the Greek word apistia, which we've seen this in the past. Uh, and it means faithlessness, i.e. negatively disbelief or lack of Christian faith, or positively unfaithfulness or disobedience. Oh, you didn't do it the way you're supposed to do it. You right. just didn't do it. And that's what he says. He says, because of your apistia, because of your faithlessness, your unbelief, your unfaithfulness. Uh, and then he says, you know, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it'll move. I just think that that's incredible. Because I feel like, you know what, that's what it says, so I should be able to say mountain move. Of course, there's people living on that mountain, so maybe that's not the will of God, you know? <laughs> just say it. So Yeshua rebuked the disciples for insufficient faith. And again, in the Mark account, it seems more like that was directed towards the Father, right? That's a good point. And so he was showing how important faith would be in their future ministry. If you are facing problems that seem as big and immovable as a mountain, turn your eyes from heaven and look to Yeshua for more faith. Then you will be able to overcome the obstacles that stand in your way. And I want to say, I truly believe that that's the prescription right there. You want more faith? Ask the Lord for it. Because even the faith that we have unto salvation was a gift from God. We do not believe because we're so smart. And we do not believe because we figured it out by reading the Bible or believing the word that was given to us by a person. We believe and have faith because the Holy Spirit put a seed inside of us, right? And that's a gift from God, which can sometimes be hard to reconcile the, you know, the derivatives of that. However, it's the truth. It's what the Bible says. Also, sometimes we will have to pray and fast in order to cast out demons. There are all kinds of fasts, and fasting for the next generation should be practiced today. And so the two reference points there are Leviticus 23, 27, which talks about uh, the fasting for the day of Yom Kippur. It actually says to afflict your souls, but obviously that's been interpreted day of atonement, as yeah. fasting for a day of atonement. And Isaiah 58, 6, Correct. Is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Well, that's a lot. You know, wow, that's powerful. The bundles of the yoke. Mm. Ooh. So then we the have bundles to, of the yoke. So discuss why is it so important to be it's, prepared? Why and is ready? it so heavy? Because there's a bundle of them. That's right. Well, yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a multiple. Yeah, they're tied amount. together. Yeah. What does it say? The anointing. You know, they say the anointing breaks the yoke, but there's also a verse that says the anointing destroys the yoke. Hallelujah. You want it to be destroyed. And that's what I want. Lord, we pray for your anointing. That's right. We want the yoke to be broken off Thank of us, you, Lord. Lord. Yes, we do. We really do. That's why it's important that we uh, target fast. Yeah. So why is it so important to be prepared and ready to help the next generation to be overcomers? Pastor Nick. That's a good question. Um, I would like to say this, though. Uh, in looking at the model of Yeshua's discipleship program, uh, so we can learn from it. Discipleship consisted of, this is what Yeshua did. This is like, a, you, know, Ma, you know, John C. Maxwell or any kind of leadership guru out there yeah. can give you some pointers on what Yeshua did and how he did discipleship. Number one, Yeshua ministers and the disciples watch. Okay, first step. Lead by example. Yep. Number two, Yeshua ministers along with the disciples. Thirdly, the disciples minister and Yeshua watches. Interesting, yeah. Sent out. Yeah. So so that's really what discipleship's all about. I like that. You do it. You have people that see you do it. Then you bring them in and say, okay, we're going to do this together. Yeah. Right? And then, um, and then I'm going to watch you. See? Interesting, yeah. So like when I was sharing about the Torah portions or whatever I was sharing every Monday night and I was doing it. And then I had my leaders join me, right? Yeah. So now I watch on Monday nights, the small circles and the feedback. See, that's discipleship. Interesting, yeah. So I love that, see, because it keeps everybody involved. 
and it's really the best thing. Yeah. You know, I would say that, uh, and I want to just look at a few verses here. I thought this was very interesting. The promises of God are to us and our children's children, basically is the concept it found in the Bible. But in Isaiah 54, 13, I love this verse. I'm going to highlight it. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. What a great promise, you know. Um, That's a good one. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. Is there an if statement on that? I feel like there's got to be an if statement. (laughs) Right? 54, right? 54, 13. And then I'm going to go to... Gosh, the Bible is so rich. You know, you can just dig through it and find little pieces of gold. This is what I'm saying. So Acts 2.39. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Wow. All your children shall be taught by the Lord. I love that. Isaiah 54.13. You know, this is why I teach my children to bless the Jewish people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We are to bless the Jewish people. I'll bless those that bless you. I'll curse those that curse you. And when you bless the Jewish people or the state of Israel, when you bless the Jewish people, you don't look for anything in return. Yeah, of course not. It's not not. reciprocal. You don't worry about it. You do it to do it out of the love of your heart. That's right. Well, that's the way all of us should be for every blessing that we give. But I'll also say this. um, You know, those promises of Abraham are to us as well. Right. So that those of us that are grafted into Israel, the higher calling for us is to bless the Jewish people. But then it also pertains to the people that deal with us, that if they're going to be a curse unto us, it's going to fall back on their head. And that's not good for them. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you stop and think about your priorities for your personal life right now, yeah, it's very important that you know the promises and that you attain them and that you move towards them. Yeah. So that's, the, that's what we have to look at. Uh, I'm very hopeful for the next generation. Yeah. Um, you know, the sad thing is 24,000 died at Baal Peor Ugh. that were meant to go into the land. Yeah. But because of sexual immorality, that turned into idolatry is what happened with that. The uh, golden calf incident was reversed. They went into idolatry that led into sexual immorality. So they're saying that idolatry is sexual immorality. Yeah. So if you're involved in sexual immorality, you're an idolater. Yeah. So that's the tough, that's the tough thing. Matter of fact, I, I want to just confirm that. And, and we're I, so desensitized. I, I, I made that statement, so I want to just confirm. Yeah, that's because it's such a mess, you know. Especially if you have a hard time uh, with this. It's uh, Colossians chapter three, verse five. Okay. Uh, Pastor Daniel Stahl shared this verse at the table one day, and I thought, "Wow, that is so powerful." Because you know, Paul was sent to the Gentiles, a bunch of pagans. Uh, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. <laughs> oh, man. So is it covetousness, which is idolatry? I think that's probably what that's saying, right? Uncleanness. All, or all of it. Yeah, evil. So fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Right. So, yeah, fornication. But unclean, so. It's interesting uncleanness is in there, too. That's that's tough. Yeah. Well, because you're not you're not clean. Well, but but you know it says uncleanness. What does does that mean? Like getting dirty? No, it doesn't mean that. It means uncleanness from a Torah perspective. You ready? I'm ready. All, All right, right you're going to read now. He's going to read. Yeshua predicts his death and resurrection. Verses 22, 22, and 22 and 23. So now, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, "The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men." And they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceeding sorrowful, exceedingly sorrowful. Wow. So this is the second time that Yeshua predicted his betrayal, death, and resurrection. Matthew sixteen twenty one. we can find it there. Uh, unfortunately, the disciples heard only the first part of Yeshua's words and became discouraged. That's why they were exceeding sorry. Now, let's stop for a second. Thank you. I just got to download. Get it. Get now, it. think about this. Because this is something that I've, I've been doing in the past, but I find it interesting. Let this tapestry of this storyline play out. I'll give you an example. So here's the Mount of Transfiguration. The Son of God is manifested, and they're, just, they're so afraid they fall on their faces. The, the, he's so brilliant and bright. It was such an experience. The disciples were actually so afraid, right? Mm-hmm. Now think about this. 
he, he glorifies himself in their presence. Yeah. That is. Whew. That's a lot. That's a lot. Okay. Yeah. But, but think about this now. Why did Yeshua come? In the flesh, God in the flesh. So that he could remarry us. That's true. But I'm looking for something else that would go along with the casting out of the devil. Mm. Why did Yeshua come? To destroy the works of the devil. That's right. Ryan, think about that. I never even thought about that. The transfiguration. Yeah. He's God. He came to destroy the works of the devil. Right after the transfiguration, he casts out this nasty devil. That's right. He did. Yeah. And he goes on to say, hey, I'm going to suffer, die, and be buried, and rise again. There's everything right there. Yeah. It's what he's doing. So if you stop and put it together, like, hmm, he glorifies. Do you remember when he did that? He showed himself. He's, and then we cast out this devil. And now he's saying he's going to suffer, die, and be buried, and he's going to rise. He's going to be resurrected. There it is all right there. Yeah. Well, and, and then there's wow. also this whole death part. The reason they're exceedingly sorrowful is, is I think that even at some point, they're putting all of the prophecies together and saying, at some point, he has to, you know, glorify the kingdom. And they're thinking of the earth, the kingdom of Israel, and they're thinking of, you know, throwing off the Roman oppression and all of these things, that he's going to be, you know, leading them in military victory. Yeah. So there's still this in the back of their Messiah mind. Messiah ben David. Right. So when they hear he dies, well, he's not going to do any of that if he dies, you know? So for them, that's the end of hope. They haven't seen this resurrection happen yet. And, and, and truly, once you've seen the resurrected Savior, now you really have hope. I mean, that's real hope because then it's like, whoa, he, j- yeah. he just did that. So hearing that he's going to die to them is like, well, that's not how this is supposed to work, right? Because they have a, a preconceived notion of how this is supposed to go. And I think all of us come to the Lord with preconceived notions that he has to break off of us, which You know, people forget that he's con- the Messiah is considered a servant, Ryan. Some people don't even know how to serve. Yeah. They're not good at it. Right. I don't know why. But the ones that can serve, they serve. Oh, yeah. You could see it. There's yeah. no act. They're serving. Yep. And those are the ones you want. But yeah. if Yeshua is a servant, if the Messiah is a servant, and it's depicted in the prophecies, this is my servant. Yeah. Then this is my, you know, this is the prophet. Then he's the package. He's the whole package. Oh, yeah. So I'm just saying that I thought that was interesting that he is the servant, too. So why aren't we serving? Yeah. I mean, if we have any inclination of who he is and what he is, he washed the disciples' feet. Because, see, the di- disciples were supposed to have that taken care of. Sure. But they dropped the ball in hospitality. Mm, yeah, they sure did. We don't do that here, but we have hospitality, great hospitality ministry. But I'm saying that now all of a sudden he's like, he gets a towel in the water and he says, okay, I'm going to do it. Huh. He sets the example. Yeah. But somebody should have already been there to do that. Sure. Or taken the, the initiative. I agree. If you want something done, do it yourself. Yeah, I've That's heard what that. Jesus, he wore that shirt. <laughs> Interesting. All I'm right. going to go down there and fix everything. That's oh, boy, did, did he. Ah. <laughs> so Matthew chapter 17, verses 24 through 27. I think it's my turn to read. It is your turn to read. Go Wait, ahead. Wait, I just read. I read 22 and 23. It's your turn to read. This is true. You're up. 20, the, you're 24 up. through 20. You want me to read? No, I'm going to read. Oh. I love to read. You said you're up. Ha, ha. You're, you're up. All right. right. Tax money in the mouth of a fish. That's a good Well, that's stuff. a nice title. Yeah, it is. That's a headline. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? He saith, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith unto him, Of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children free. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast a hook and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money that take and give unto them for me and thee. Tax free for the children because it's school year. <laughs> I just thought about that. So, so uh, tax money in the mouth of a fish. Uh, let's take this and break this down verse by verse because there's a couple things in here uh, that are interesting. So, Oh, yeah. Uh, verse 24, and when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money co- uh, came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? So that's interesting. So this word tribute is the Greek word didrachman. And it means a double drachma. 
a silver coin equal to two Attic drachmas or one Alexandrian or one half shekel. Interesting. Here's some commerce for you. This that's right. is perfect for this you. Is, oh, yeah, absolutely. Split it up into little pieces. This is right pieces. up your shekels. Yeah. That's <laughs> right up your shekels. <laughs> I love uh, a percentage of a percentage. Yes. It adds up, let me tell you. Um, so at the annual census, each person over the age of 20 was to give a half shekel offering for support of the tabernacle, which was later applied to the temple. And that's found in Exodus. Uh, and everybody gave Chapter that, 30, 11 through 16. Exactly right. Now, everybody gave. Now, so this is... As they're entering Capernaum, there's a tax booth, right? And they're hollering at him like, yo, you're going to come in here. Yeah. Um, so this is interesting. So uh, verses 25 and 26, uh, he saith, yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter, Peter saith unto him, of strangers, Jesus saith unto him, then the children, then are the children free. So this is interesting, right? The children don't have to pay tribute because they're part of the family. But the strangers coming in yeah. have to pay tribute. Interesting point. It's customary. You know, is he talking about family again? Jesus just wants family, Ryan. Are you about to say blood is thicker than water? Uh, yeah, because... Jesus just wants family, doesn't he? Does. He does, he does. It's interesting. So tax collectors set up booths to collect these taxes. Uh, only Matthew records this incident. And so perhaps this is recorded by Matthew because he had been a tax collector himself. That's right. Interesting. I do find this an interesting story. Um, so Yeshua is saying that tribute has to be paid by the strangers, not the children, the ones that are passing through, because the children have equity or ownership. Yeah, good point. Whereas the stranger is just using it temporarily. So it's like playing Monopoly, right? If you own the property when you land on it, you don't have to pay the rent, right? Good point. But if you don't own the property and you land on it, you have to pay the is rent. Is that when Yeshua was saying, I give the bread to the children? It's not meat to give the children. Yeah. Uh, it's, yes, it is. So, yeah, basically, yeah. So now you're back to where she wasn't To joined. the dogs, to so throw the children's yeah. food But even the dogs the dog. get the crumbs. Right, that's so what she says. Yeah. She pushes her way in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm trying to unpack that a little bit in my brain and just understand, like, all of the ways that us becoming the sons of God then changes the way that what, we interact what, with the world. What about give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God what is God? But that's dual. It is. That's both. You, yeah. So you can't say there's a separation of church and state. Well, but we are not of this world, right? That's what I'm saying. But though. we are in the world, and therefore yeah. we are strangers to the world, and we owe tribute for using. So, like, if there's so, taxes so. or something, you know, we should right pay them because which you know, I think what Jesus says here validates that because we are strangers in a strange land, right? We're we're not of this world. We're just in it temporarily. It's interesting. They 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 pass this tax money. I don't know this infrastructure i think they passed an infrastructure law yeah i think it came through the senate i think it did come through yeah but it probably won't be implemented till messiah comes <laughs> well they're gonna so give the money to their cronies first we're going to <laughs> be working for the department of transportation yeah i'm pretty sure even like the original Bridges stimulus and packages and, and, and stuff yeah remember infrastructure the, those uh shovel ready jobs weren't so shovel ready <laughs> it's interesting though when you think about it though when messiah comes back i mean what are we going to be doing you don't get a new heaven and new earth after a thousand years. Ah, uh, yeah. It is interesting to think that he's going to come down. He's like, y'all made your earth, now you lie. He's going to come down and rule and reign. Yeah. Heaven comes to earth. Interesting. All right, so verse 27. It says here, Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast a hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up. When thou d hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. That take and give unto them for me and thee. So I found this pretty cool, right? Yeshua used this situation to teach Peter Yeshua's kingly role. Just as kings pay no taxes and collect none from their families, Yeshua the king owed no taxes. However, Yeshua supplied the tax payment for both himself and Peter rather than offending those who didn't understand his kingship. 
And Yeshua once again proves his deity by miraculously having a coin to pay the tax in the mouth of a fish that Peter had to retrieve. If he was just the son of God, he couldn't do it. Well, Think um, about it. He can't do that. Um, I don't, I don't know. know. I'm just saying. Yeah, I think he can do I'm whatever just, God gives him power to, to do be. That. I think even we could do it if God had called but us to do it. But what power does he have but to be God? All power. That's what I'm saying. He has He's got the power to be God. He, he says, is God. He says, all power has been given man, unto me on heaven and on earth. 100% man, 100% God. Yeah, it's 200%. <laughs> so, I found this interesting because at first I was like, I can imagine Peter, like, kind of mumbling under his breath, we need to keep the tax instead of just reaching his pocket and grabbing a coin. He's going to send me out to go get a fish out of the water. What am I going to do with a fish? You know, like I was thinking that. But then I remembered, Peter has seen fish miracles before, right? That's true. Remember he fished all a night? A lot of fish. And last time he gave Jesus trouble. He was like, I've been fishing all night. Ain't no fish in the water, bruh. But Jesus was like, no, no, no. Go ahead. Throw, throw your net in on the other side. And he does it. And then like, so much fish that he, he couldn't even fit it all in the boat. They had to call another boat over and fill up the other boat. So so uh, Peter has witnessed fish miracles And he before. was able to pay off his debt. I like that in The Chosen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He showed that in The Chosen. Right. He was like in debt. Yeah. He was in over his head. Oh, yeah. And next thing you know, boom. So in this case, this is to pay tribute, right, to pay the tax. And I like this because it's another fish miracle for a fisherman who becomes a fisher of men. You know, and what does he do? He pulls it out of the water and boom, in the mouth of the fish, there's a coin. So I thought that was pretty cool. That was pretty cool. And people say, well, why did he do that? Because he can. Right. He can. Well, I was like, well, why not just reach in your pocket and make a coin appear then, Lord? But that wouldn't have had as cool of a story. You know, he does these things. Um, you know, that's the other cool thing. Like the disciples get to be on the inside. They're chosen to witness these things. I know. He, he picked them. How cool is that? I wish, you know, like I told I, I want to be in those See, years. he even picked Judas, the treasurer, who was stealing out of the bag and everything. I mean, yeah. he, he picked him because it was a prophecy. But I'm saying that, you know, people have to approach us to be a disciple. You can't really go after someone yeah, to yeah, disciple yeah, yeah, them. Yeah, 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 I got you. If someone comes alongside you and says, hey, can you spend some time with me? Can, can you help me? And you say, yeah, you know, that's discipleship. Yeah. You know, that's what you're, not, you're doing it. Yeah. And, um, and I get to encourage them. Out. But yeah, if anybody comes to us, we need to help them. We yeah. be there for them. Hey, I can, I can meet with you. Let's do, you know, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of cool. I agree. I agree. All right. So what two points can be learned from Matthew 17, 14 through 27? What do you have? Because I only have one thing. All right. I'll give you both of mine. So um, these two came from uh, Desmond Vega and uh, Elisha, Charles' grandson, last night. Um, my first point was, don't expect to have Jesus' power if you have little faith. So you got to have faith to have the power. So I thought that was an interesting concept they came up with. The second one was, you should not be afraid of death. Jesus has you if you have him. And I thought that was pretty cool, too. It's like, wow. Interesting. Um, one point I have is we need to pray and fast for the next generation. Oh, I agree with that. We need to pray and fast for the next generation. That's a prayer target. So that's all right. You know, the, with the Daniel fast, we can throw our young people in that as well. The next generation, because they are the seed of Israel. Uh, another point would probably be to, I would say, uh, basically to obey the laws of the land. Yeah. You know, as long as it's not causing you to sin. And I would also add to this whole thing that if you need an extra measure of faith, ask the Lord for it and he will supply it. I mean, that's I like where our that. faith comes from anyways. Although sometimes asking for more faith gives you more opportunities to need faith. Kind of like patience. How do you build your patience? Well, the Lord gives you opportunities to be patient. And, you know, I don't know that um, I'm really interested in that. Because, <laughs> you know, the King James for patience is long-suffering. You know, people get it all mixed up, Ryan, in closing here, my last thought. People get things so mixed up. Yeah. He'll never put on you, right, more than you can handle yeah. as far as temptation. Right. But when it comes to tests, trials, tribulation. Yeah. 
not temptation. He right. Can, he can just dump, it's like a dump truck yep. on you. You know, and there's so many lessons to be learned. Yeah. What's he doing in you and through you? I'm learning this. Okay, there's a lesson to be learned here. This is taking some time. So you're going to learn a lot as you put it together, what he was trying to do. Yeah. You know, because things don't go your way. Right, right. They don't always go your way. And you can quote all the verses you want. I know. About your situation. It doesn't merit anything because you're going to go through it. Well, even Paul says that he asked the Lord for healing of whatever the the thorn in his flesh was. And the Lord told him, my grace is sufficient for you. Godly riches at Christ's expense. Things I don't want to hear him say. My grace is sufficient. But you you've know, already got enough grace. <laughs> the Lord chastises us according to our character. Yeah. And um, some have said that the Apostle Paul was kind of high-minded, prideful, very knowledgeable, the yeah. scholar. Yeah. But, you know, I mean. Aren't we all? Yeah, I'm just, I don't want to point out his faults, but it would only make sense that God would have to buffet him because of that, because yeah. he was sent to the Gentiles. And, yeah, I guess so. I mean, think about it. A very learned Jew has to go to the pagans. Yeah. See, people don't understand all that. But he magnified his office. You know, I just I just say that he was from the tribe of Benjamin. Yeah. So it's kind of like only fitting that he would go to part of the house of Joseph because he's Benjamin. He's right. part of the house. Yeah. But I like how God turns it around because King Saul was in the tribe of Benjamin, was a poor leader. Right. And um, interesting, yeah. The Apostle Paul is from the tribe of Benjamin. It's all tribal. Yes. It's well, all and tribal. and remember, he was sent to the Gentiles to go pull out the house of Joseph, right? And Benjamin and Joseph both have the same mother, Rachel, and so they're 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 full blooded brothers. Right. So that's an interesting point. So too. that's a good point. It is. All right. Well, awesome portion of scripture. I hope that you guys will meditate on this this week. Uh, receive it into your spirit, and uh, ask the Lord for more faith. You know, Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we thank you. We just ask, God, that you would give us the faith to call on your name and to do the signs and wonders and miracles that you've called us to do, even if it takes fasting, Lord, and prayer. The, the, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, God. And so we stand on these promises, God, and we just ask you to fill us with your spirit. Give us the power and authority to do greater works than these, Lord, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. And I pray that for you guys also today. Uh, if you guys uh, have any questions or, or anything, you know, you want some resources from us, you can email me at ryan at twopraise.net or you can comment uh, on any of our social media channels. Uh, but if you want me to send you something, obviously the easiest way to do that is to email me. So. And don't forget, we are in the book of Deuteronomy. Make That's sure right. You read your Torah portions. That's right. Devarim. We have started Devarim. So uh, I hope you guys are doing well. Hope you enjoyed this. Bless you. Have a great week. 